Okay, so today I'm, I'm going to be talking about assessing the value of open access agreements from a consortium perspective. So I'm going to be speaking as JISC as a consortium representing libraries yeah. in the UK, um, but also JISC as a data service provider. Alongside that, I'm also going to be drawing from, on interviews I've had with um, librarians very recently. So in particular, in this session, I'm going to be focusing on the place of, where I see the place, of use statistics, especially counter stats. Oh, thank you. <laughs> especially counter stats um, and the, where the work we're already doing in on a practical level at JISC. So I'm going to be covering the what, when and why and then I'll be handing over to Tasha who's going to tell you how counter can help. So first some context. So up on the screen here I've got the agreements that JISC collections negotiated for journal agreements where there's an OA publishing element. So this isn't all of our agreements, this is just the OA ones. So as you can see, we've got 41 transition agreements, 23 community-based ones, six native OA, and five subscribed to open. And there's also a publisher that's supporting a green compliant route um, to fund requirements. And the reason I'm showing this is I want to show that there's a diversity of the agreements that we have available. Um, today, I think a lot of the discussion has been very much, and a lot of our analytics work also, has been very focused on transition agreements. But today, I want to speak about open access um, agreements very broadly. So as you can see, the agreements are very varied. Um, anyone who's worked with them will also know they're very complex and they are still evolving. So the way we evaluate them is definitely an emerging area. I think it makes start sense to start um, by saying a little bit about what we mean by value. So when I recently interviewed, um, interviewed librarians, one thing, a question they are really grappling with at the moment is, well, what does good value look like um, in an OA deal? What does value mean to us now? And we don't necessarily have the answer for that yet, um, but we have been working closely um, within in JISC with our, with our strategic groups to understand what the values and measures um, we should be looking at when we're considering the evaluation and monitoring. And of course, when we're talking about value, we're not just talking about value for money, although that is still really important. We're also talking about the effectiveness of the agreement and its wider impact. Now, the obvious place to start when it comes to evaluation is to think about what we are trying to achieve. And when it comes to transition agreements and other types, what we do is we go back and look at the requirements set by our sector. And we measure ourselves against those. Overall, we're generally seeking the same thing. We're looking to accelerate the transition to open access, ensure its sustainability, um, and also improve or ease workflows. As for when we do this evaluation, at a high level, we are continually monitoring open access agreements and their performance. We also take, undertake one-off one um, data analysis, so landscape reviews. But if we come back to thinking about individual agreements, there are three main stages. Firstly, there's the proposal stage. At this point, we are really looking to support our conversations with publishers and librarians. And this may go through several iterations. At this stage, we're really trying to make predictions about potential future value and benefits based on past data. And we really do this at a sector level and institution level as well, because we are representing a wide and diverse range of institutions. And then, of course, when it comes to signing up, an institution needs to make a decision about whether they want to contribute to that initiative or not. Then there's a, finally, there's a renewal stage where both the publisher, the JISC and the institutions all need to decide whether it's worth continuing with that deal. So, so far, I've been talking about um, use of stats, for, I'm sorry, I've been talking about um, agreements and evaluation very generally. Um, and any of you who have ever had to analyse an OA agreement will know it requires a lot of interconnected data. But as I said, today I really want to focus in on where uses data slots into that big web. Um, but before I do, I just want to sort of stress that other data sets are really important, um, in particularly uh, the publications reports, which are critical to the evaluation and monitoring um, and management of agreements. So in the next few slides, I'm just going to run through some of the key questions um, that I've um, discussed with um, licensing managers and data analysts internally, and also our strategic groups and, and institutions. So these are the sort of questions that they're asking about agreements, and they're ones where I think um, use of stats can play a role. So let's start with the most obvious use case, and so that's to refer data-informed um, negotiations. So within JISC, we are very data-driven and consultative um, approach when it comes to negotiation. 
And so we work with a lot of different data, as I said. But these are the three areas where I think um, we can um, use this data can really help out. So firstly, we've got which titles in a publisher's portfolio are most important, uh, it, particularly in the UK context. To what extent are the UK needs being met by OA content currently? And how are these patterns changing over time? Are we seeing more open um, compared to closed usage? Another area of interest, um, particularly for our transition agreement oversight site group, but also other librarians and, and us more generally, is looking at flipped journals. So what's the impact and um, the global impact of a flipped journal? Um, is it actually seeing more usage now that it's open? What are the trends over the time, looking at both portfolio and publisher level, UK versus um, global, for example? And then a key question is, well, where does the UK sit within this international landscape? What's its effective contribution to flipping titles to open access? Now, when it comes to institutions and the institutional perspective, especially for librarians, um, the key question and concern for them is very much around budgets and justifying spend. So, as many of you may be probably aware, OA agreements are largely funded or paid for out of subscriptions or collections budgets within libraries. Often these are um, propped up by contributions for other OA funds, but that's not always the case. And at some point in the future, it's not really going to make sense anymore for these deals to be paid for out of a subscriptions budget. Um, the higher-ups within the institution and in the finance teams are going to ask, start asking questions about where this, how this, the budget should be organised and managed. So from a librarian's perspective, they're really looking to make a case for open access, generally, so that they can secure budget and justify spend. There are two general approaches you can take to doing this. Um, first, they want to look at, well, what are the benefits to our in institution? How much usage are we seeing from open access content, either that we paid for or maybe we haven't contributed to? But what benefits are we getting back from open access? Uh, the other approach is to look at what we've been publishing. Can we demonstrate that we've increased the reach of our research by making it open access? <laughs> And then finally, I just wanted to mention the impact of policies. So one thing we're already doing um, is looking at citations and comparing citations of funded and non-funded research outputs. And a natural extension to this would be to look at um, full text usage as well. So what does all this mean for how we work with usage data? Well, when I look at these questions, I can see that there's still a lot of interest in seeing paywall usage, usage aggregated by a title or journal, usage aggregated at the publisher level, usage attributed to institutions and annual trends. These key bits of information are the same information we're used to working with. But I can also see there's a lot of interest in global usage of both open and paywalled content, total usage of, co of content in the UK, not just that attributed to UK institutions, and the global reach and country of use. I also think we need to take a slightly different approach um, to how we think about working with usage stats. So before I go on to talk about the more technical and practical aspects, I want to share some observations about where I think we need to sort of shift our thinking a bit around the place of usage data in evaluation. So when I speak to people, um, individuals, whether they come from a scholarly comms background or a subscription background, I can clearly see they're approaching the question of value from a very different direction. In particular, when we're looking at read and publish deals, it's often the case that the read component is evaluated basically on or how much of the description content has been used. And then the publish um, element is evaluated separately based on how much did we publish under the agreement. And there's nothing wrong with this. They're really important questions about the derived value for the institution and for the wider sector. However, it is missing a trick. It's, it kind of misses the impact um, and the bigger picture. You may also want to consider that as more content becomes openly available, it will become increasingly more difficult to interpret those metrics and determine whether they still mean good value. What happens to the cost per use metric? Is it even a useful metric anymore? Evaluation um, has never been about cost and use alone, and it shouldn't be about publications and cost either. And that brings us on to the, the idea of indirect value. So with agreements such as the community-based models um, and some of the subscribed to open, the value derived by the institution is less direct. So we need to tell a very different story with the evidence and data that we have available. It becomes more about like how does 
this align with the institution's wider strategic aims and objectives? How, do, how does it support our sustainability goals? And looking at how we can demonstrate a link between these. Another point I wanted to rate was about thinking beyond the publisher's platform. So having content on multiple platforms is certainly not a new thing. Um, but traditional models and acquisitions models, you find that it's very easy to make a link between the title um, and the subscription and the purchase. However, when you have a, an open access content and it's available, for example, in um, a full text database, um, how are we ascribing the value um, to that? These are questions I don't necessarily answer to, but certainly something to think about. And particularly when we get into the OA books at space, where there, it's very common to have multiple, uh, a book on multiple platforms, we need to think about how we might want to bring that usage data together. And finally, I think we need to think differently about how we slice the data. So historically, counter data has been about the publisher, the platform, and the institution, and at title level. And this makes a lot of sense for subscription content, because Counter was developed in line with that. When I first try to explain global and item usage, especially to subscription librarians, they don't always get it straight away at first. It takes them a little while to get their head around it, because they can't really visualise what a report looks like and what data it will contain. And I think that's because we need to think about how we slice the data very differently. So this brings us on to why item level reporting is so important. So when I was reviewing those questions, and you may have noticed this too, that the usage of the individual items doesn't necessarily really feature in those questions. But I do know there is interest in item level data. For example, I know repository managers want to know what the most used items are in their repository. They use that for evaluating and demonstrating the importance of institutional repositories themselves. I know that authors are interested in how much their content, their, their research output is being used. And there's also interest from institutions where they can use individual items to demonstrate the, um, to see the strength of their research output. However, when it comes to OA, cons OA evaluations um, at a consortium level, we're primarily interested in aggregated usage. Now, one of the main challenges that comes up when we talk about item reports is that they are huge and very unwieldy. But in practice, no one is ever going to want to look at a giant spreadsheet with lots of items in it. The vast majority of the time, we're really interested in aggregated usage. We're looking at taking out a subset of the items and then looking at the total. Now, the counter reports do allow you to do this. Um, you can take out subsets, for example, as I got on the screen here, we can see that we can take out um, articles on a platform. You can also take out all the articles in a journal. You can slice it by year of publication. However, this doesn't always align with, with all of our use cases. It's actually more likely that we're going to want to look at all articles published under a particular agreement, or associated with particular authors, or under a particular um, funder grant, for example. And then, from a, say, from a consortium perspective, we'll be looking to, to aggregate that up into total usage. So we can quickly see that title-level granularity really isn't sufficient. And so it does make sense to think about the item as the basic unit of reporting so that we can extract that data and aggregate it up by any attribute, whether it's in the counter report or not. Now, obviously, the counter reports can't do this job on their own, and which is where the importance of quality metadata, persistent identifiers and infrastructure comes in. So in order for us to make effective use, full and effective use of item data to inform our evaluation of OA agreements, we need to have metadata about the item. We need to know what's been published, where it's been published, the author affiliation, who funded it, for example. And we can use multiple sources to do that. We, have, we create our own data sets internally, and then we also work with other systems as well. And we're looking to expand those integrations. So we've, we work with publisher systems, Crossref, there's Open Alex, Open Access Switchboard, and databases such as Scopus, Web of Science, and Dimensions. And of course, in order to automate these processes um, and ensure we, we're saving time, we need to be able to consistently match on identifiers. Um, so I've mentioned a few here, some of the obvious ones, and I'm not going to go into detail because that's a whole separate presentation. So we haven't necessarily worked out all of the detail, technical details of how we're going to achieve this in a certain way, but we do have a very good idea of all the elements that need to come together to make this work. So first, we've got our data management. So 
Um, internally within, within our team, we do a lot of work to collect and create and clean the data, and we're really looking to automate those processes more. We do need data analyst expertise, which we have, to drive those insights. As I've mentioned, we also need to, to draw on other data sets. Next thing we need to do is really think about how um, we make these data sets accessible and reusable, um, so that they're interoperable and easy for other people to digest and make use of. So next is the concept of presentation. Um, so as I said earlier, we need to tell a different story around the usage data. One way of doing this is through um, presentation of dashboards, it's through different metrics. There's different ways we can approach this. So partly this is about making um, the content digestible so it's easily understandable, but also allowing people to access it. And finally, we need a shared understanding. We need to understand the metrics that we're using um, so that we can build a body of ev evidence to support our conversations. Um, so what are we doing at the moment with global and idle stats? I just want to highlight um, four areas where we're currently working. So firstly, we are currently working to pull um, counter item reports into our JOSP service. Um, so those of you that don't know, that's our service that collects um, counter reports on behalf of multiple open institutions from multiple publishers and pulls it all together in one place. We're looking to expand our offering to include item reports as well. Next, we're also going to be looking at the global item reports. So very soon, we're going to be approaching publishers to request global um, item reports. Sorry, yeah, global, global reports. To firstly, we want to firstly we want to determine the availability out there, um, and secondly, we want to prototype some visualizations, which we're going to share for, for feedback. And this is really going to inform the future direction of our data collection services and how at GIS we measure. Um, evaluate um, agreements more holistically. The other thing I want to mention is our other service. So we have a service called the Institutional Repository Usage Statistics Service um, called IRIS. And we have, um, in IRIS, we have been providing item and global level stats for repositories for many years. It's a completely open service. So if you want to go and have a global item report now, um, you can do so. Um, and finally, I want to mention that <coughs> Um, we're looking to take the repository usage data and take a case study approach to apply it to an analysis of um, a self uh, agreement with a self-archiving element, and that's something we're, we're planning to do internally and then write up and present. And then finally, before I hand over to Tasha, I just wanted to mention array monographs. So in this presentation, I have been very much focused on um, articles and journals, because that's where our focus has been to date. Um, however, we have already started thinking a lot about how we support open access monographs. Um, and that, I'll hand over to Tasha. Thank you, Laura. Well, Laura has rather answered my first question, which was going to be to all of you, which is, do you think counter is only for subscription content? And clearly, the answer is no. What I will say is that 20 years ago, when counter was first conceived, it was a subscription first concept, measuring the usage of materials to which a library had subscribed. And back in 2017, when we started building release five of the code of practice, we were very aware that we needed to start accommodating open access in a much more streamlined way. So release five introduced the concept of the global report, which does not break down usage by institutional attribution. However, it was 2017. <laughs> Things have moved on somewhat, and release 5.1, which is our next update, is going live in April, come hell, high water, or the house collapsing. And release 5.1 doesn't just accommodate open access, open access, it has been optimized for open access. So let's start with this idea of the global report. Oh, this has gone a bit funky on this screen. Um, counter acknowledges that usage of materials can be attributed to an institution. So that is linked to a specific library. So for example, if a user is sat within the campus IP range and gets access to paywalled content, 
simply by virtue of that IP, that is usage that can be attributed to that institution. Non-attributed usage is everything else. And back in 2020, when a lot of publishers dropped their paywalls because of COVID, we saw non-attributed usage balloon. However, even before that point, a lot of publishers were telling Counter that the majority of their usage was non-attributed, in some cases up to 80%. So this is valuable material, whether it is free to read, whether it is open access, whether it is paywalled. It is valuable material that is being read in maybe 80% of cases by people who don't then get reported back to an institution. So the concept of the global report is we don't care if it is attributed or non-attributed. We really don't care which institution it's attributed to. We want to see everything, the global usage. Release 5 also introduced the concept of the item report. And Laura has given a very detailed description of that, so I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail. But it is a very granular piece of information. It can tell you all the counter metrics. So the investigations, that's, that's people using just the metadata, and the requests, so that's the, the, the interaction with the full content, down to the article level, or indeed down to the book chapter level. Great. An item report is wonderful. What we're talking about for open access is that combination of the two, global and granular, the global item report. Now, when you are thinking as a library who has funded a piece of open access content, or you are thinking as a funder who has funded a piece of open access content, are you really worried about what usage has been made within your specific institution of that article or that book? Or do you want to know what your impact has been globally? And when we speak with librarians, and in my new life, we encounter, I speak to librarians every day, this is what they're telling me they want. They may not know the words for it, but this is what they want. One of the reasons that they want that information is because they see usage as part of the suite of impact metrics. Now, there's lots of lovely definitions of, of impact, and they are generally about holistic assessment of the results of a piece of work on social interactions or whatever. Unfortunately, we are human and we like numbers because they are easy to count and measure. So as a community, we have often boiled usage down to citations. And the problem with citations is that they can take a very long time to accrue. And they're sometimes a bit worrying because you know, the, the, the paper on MMR and autism has some of the highest citation rates anywhere. Not necessarily a positive paper. We've also introduced altmetrics, which are very quick to accrue, but they're quite fleeting at measures of attention. Usage is that missing piece of the puzzle. It accrues from the day of publication and it reflects real interaction with the content. It is not, however, a silver bullet. As with all metrics, we should be handling them with great care. Now, I wanted to spend as much time as possible listening to Laura and then taking Q&A, so I'm going to wrap up very shortly but I do have a call to action for our librarian and consortia colleagues. When it comes to the global item report, the power is in your hands. You can tell publishers that this is what you require. You can put it into your deal contracts. I can't make publishers offer this, though many already do. You can, so if you want it, ask for it. And questions? Anthony Watkinson, Cyber Research. 
Um, it's a question which maybe seem a little strange in this context, but if we're talking about value, publishers and researchers think in terms of quality. The word quality hasn't been used. Can you explain where it fits in, if at all? So, Counter has never purported to measure quality. No. That is not what we are for. Um, it is an important metric. This is why I say that any research should be considered on its own merits. Um, and that needs to be done by people who have knowledge of that specific discipline and preferably people who have knowledge of how that research has been used. And that's not something that we as counter can deliver. Laura, from the GISC perspective, I'm sure you've got other insights. Um, yes, it's on. Okay, cool. Um, so I think from a GIST perspective, I, well, my, my presentation, I if deliberately um, stayed away from the question of quality and the question of value um, uh, because it's not an area we particularly get into. So I think from a consortium perspective and when it comes to evaluation of deals, we're not necessarily looking at the quality of the research. We are looking at evaluating how effective that deal is in achieving its goals. And that's usually around us supporting the publication process um, and making content openly available. So that's kind of like the way we are measuring the effectiveness of an OA agreement. Are we helping support our institutions achieving their goals? Thank you very much. I can see Phil at the back, and uh, do you want to go first at the front? I actually can't see who it is because there's just light. Hi, Ros Pine from Bloomsbury. Um, so Laura talked about bringing together usage statistics from different platforms, which I agree is incredibly important for OA because the whole point about OA is that people can share the content anywhere and, um, and that's part of, of reaching a wider audience. But of course one challenge with that is that different, different platforms are collecting different sorts of metrics and we don't really have any standards. And I wondered if you see a role for kind of counter in helping to kind of establish those sorts of standards and how we can, how we can come up with useful metrics, useful ways of bringing together those metrics, which mean that we can kind of really kind of compare like with like and, and truly understand sort of impact across multiple platforms. I may be asking for like a ridiculously impossible large thing here, but I'm, I'm interested to know how do we start that? Um, so from our perspective, we're all constantly um, encouraging publishers and platforms to um, take up counter, um, counter compliance, uh, particularly when we're negotiating deals, we include it in our, where possible, we try to include it in our, in our, um, our model licence. Um, and it's something we're definitely pushing for. I know the two of us spoke yesterday about um, the more uh, Amazon, for example, are probably not going to take up counter compliance, but where it comes to a scholarly platform, um, I think it's absolutely essential that they um, put effort into making their, their, their usage reports counter compliance so we can make that comparison. It's definitely something we're already doing. We already pull together data from multiple sources and having the power of having that in a consistent um, measurable, uh, a consistent format is really useful. Um, and one thing we're planning to do next year is also look at how we can pull together um, repository usage generating from our IRIS service um, with um, publisher, um, publisher generated usage as well so we can get a much better picture of the impact of that research output, not just the one that ends up on the publisher website. So I would add to that, call to action for the publishers among us. I would love for aggregators to start delivering global counter reports back to the publishers who have provided them with the material in the first place so that the publisher has a much clearer picture of the true global usage of their materials. Um, I have to echo Laura's comment that not everybody has yet taken up counter. Uh, many have. And even those who have chosen not to offer counter reports could make use of the SUSHI protocol, which is the automated harvesting protocol, and the JSON 
schema that goes alongside that to at least make it easier for materials to uh, usage report materials to be consolidated and aggregated even if the metrics themselves might be slightly different in non-counter uh, platforms. Thank you. <laughs> Phil. Phil Jones from More Brains Cooperative. So we've been, as, a, as an industry or as a sector, I suppose, we've been looking at the problem of distributed item level or aggregated item level uh, usage data for, for as long as I've been in the industry. Um, so, and part of the problem is that it's very, very difficult to identify whether one version of, a, of an item is the same thing as another version of an item. Um, and it's been difficult since we've had aggregators, it's been uh, difficult for every time a new sort of platform enters it, and now we've got repositories and preprint servers, and very often sometimes the, the metadata in those services isn't as good as it would need to be in order to be able to link objects and items. So since we've been looking at this for a very long time and we still haven't managed to get those links really working, what do we need to do, perhaps on a organizational level or a social level or, or a communications level, to try to get people to take these linkages more seriously than they have? Are you trying to get me to plug your PID project? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a thumbs up over here, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, on, honestly, we have to take the question of metadata more seriously, and we need persistent identifiers to crosswalk from between systems. There is no quick way to make that level of cultural change, much as I wish there was. I don't have, I don't have the bad there. Um, I think of, yeah, I want to stress in this, the there is an importance of persistent identifiers. It's the only way we can do it, particularly when we get to that granular detail, we can't do these matching manually. We need a way of doing that effectively at scale and persistent identifiers and clean metadata the way forward. But I definitely recognize the, stra the challenges there. My name is John Dove. My name is John Dove and I'm an advocate for open access. And I want to take it back to 2014 when I was deciding to take this up as my last career, as long as my fingers can reach a keyboard. I was on the Purdue University Press Advisory Board, and I think the statute of limitations has passed, so I, I don't think I'm revealing confidential information. Uh, at the dinner, the library director said that in 2004, he had an $8 million um, bill for, for scholarly journals. And this year, it was going up from 14 million to 14.6, so up $600,000. And he had to go to the new president, who was a businessman, to say, we need $600,000 more. And he said, what do you mean, 600000 why is that? And so that turned into a conversation about open access. So he, the president said, well, you're going to have to give a presentation to the faculty senate about open access. So now. The press was doing a lot of things in terms of open access and promoting it and picking out a scholar. And I think a lot of universities have scholarly communication or publishing consultants who help their authors be able to pick good open access journals. And, um, and they actually give a prize for, for the professor who most exhibited uh, the principles of open science. They did a lot of things. But if I was that president, I would want to know, all right, you're doing these open access things. What effect is it having? I would like to know, what is the adoption of publishing of open access within my university? Is it going up? Is it staying level? Has it reached up a, to a plateau and then let, plateaued? Or is it rising again? Did the pandemic increase it or does it decrease it? So I really am hoping that out of your counter stats that you'll be able to give institutionally specific publishing characteristics of the faculty and researchers at that institution so that people in the institution who are advocating for open access can actually do it with real numbers. So counter very specifically is privacy protective by design. While we will, obviously, we do include things like the, the DOI of, of articles or chapters that are published, we include the authors if that information is, is available, which it may not be for a, a reference work item, for example. Um, you don't need 
counter reports to measure the output of an institution's open access materials versus paywalled materials. What the counter reports can tell you is how much global usage one particular article is receiving when it is open versus if an article was closed. So you will be able to see the global impact of your work. But the other information that Laura's team collects in terms of outputs is not coming from the counter materials. Yeah, that's correct. So I think with, um, with our Iris stats, we did look into sort of pulling in information, additional information around um, sort of internal faculties, etc. But every institution is very different. You can't standardise that. It doesn't really make sense to have a standard around um, something that varies so much. Um, but one thing we, yeah, we do is, is we pull that data together from other locations and then create the reports. And that's where we sort of come back to the idea of having these sort of accessible, reusable data sets. Count as one element. We can draw um, data from other places and we can pull it together and allow other people to reuse that data in some way. Aaron, do we have any more time? Because I can't see the clock from here. Okay. Yeah. Just one other one point. Sorry, just one other point on that um, was that um, when I was speaking to librarians, one suggestion they also made is it doesn't necessarily the use doesn't have to come via the counter reports. We could embed counter um, usage at an item level in the publication reports is another option. So rather than institutions having to receive publication reports from the publishers and the counter reports from the publishers. One option is that the publishers, um, publishers could provide a report which has the pub items published at an institution and the usage data in the same report. I've no idea how technically feasible that is, but it's effectively the same thing. It's just who does that, that piece of work of mapping up items. I can see we've got a question about uh, a challenge of how to measure usage outside of the publisher's platform, what measures and initiatives are being taken to get a full picture of usage. Um, as I've said, we are encouraging uh, aggregators to provide that information back to the original source of publication. There was an initiative that had the terribly unfortunate acronym of DULL, Distributed Usage Logging. <laughs> Can you tell Count is not particularly good at coming up with, <laughs> with good names? Um, and that was designed to aggregate usage metrics based on DOI from anywhere across the, anywhere across the, the web. Uh, that has sort of subsided. Uh, the other m initiative that I'm involved with at the moment is the Open Access eBook Usage Data Trust. There's a lot of information on their website, but they're looking specifically at books um, and specifically at open access books, so it, it's, it's taking a, a sort of a chunk of the problem rather than the, the, the uh, challenge in aggregate. Jake, and then we've got one last online question. Uh, Jake Zarnagar, uh, Silver Chair. Um, as a platform provider, I can tell you that the 80% unattributed usage, you need to be careful with how you use and interpret that data. That is filled with people. It's also filled with bots. It's filled with a whole group of uh, uh, usage that may not be on parallel to usage you can attribute uh, to either a person or an institution. So just uh, wanted to put out there that I wouldn't just add the numbers together. Uh, everyone should be thinking about attributed versus unattributed. It's, it's, it's useful to know, but it, it has it's d more dangerous in how it can be gamed uh, uh, in the system. So just wanted to add that. Just to clarify, those were the counter attributed and unattributed after all the bot usage had been stripped out, because we have quite rigorous bot restrictions. But yes, I take your point. If you're looking at, uh, we can't catch everything. We're not magicians. Um, if you are taking your Google Analytics, it's going to be a very different picture. Laura, there's a question on the screen which I think is more for you. Right, so in the subscription area, the library budgets, with library budgets constrained, I feel constantly dismayed by the huge amount of time and energy that went into uses and analysis last year to decide which journals had to be cancelled. It felt so depressing. How do we not bring the same mindset to the OA world? Aside from understanding the value of repositories, do librarians want to know the usage mostly for pricing negotiations for 
published part of deals, or are there many more reasons to, for the work and effort involved in the part of the institution? Um, yes, so I definitely th think um, we need to change the way we think about, um, particularly from the maybe subscriptions side of things, is think about how we link the usage um, to the idea of value for money. Um, and so the value for money side of things is definitely needs to change slightly. And I think we do need to make a really much more indirect um, um, and a stronger narrative around why AOA is important. And I think usage data can definitely fit into that. Um, but I'm also wary of like the idea that the deal is evaluated on how much has been published and the value of money becomes, well, how much we are we publishing for the, the, what we're putting in. And I think we definitely need to think much more broadly and see uses stats as a way of showing that there is a greater impact um, and value for making content openly available. But that it's much easier, it's very easy to use um, a cost per use or an effective APC um, as, a, as a measure. It's much more difficult to tell that, um, that wider narrative around usage data and its importance. And I think that's, that is going to require a bit more work, but it's definitely doable. And if we work together, um, and do things at consortium level and work with publishers, um, then we can build that narrative and we can explain why open access is important um, in that context and why that particular deal. So I think when it comes to evaluating at an institutional level, it does really come back to, well, does this deal, does this publisher align with um, our strategic aims and what we're trying to achieve, what our collection and portfolio is um, and how we're publishing? Those are still really important questions. Um, it's not all about the usage um, and the cost. And we are out of time now. So thank you, everybody, for giving us patience. <laughs>